Hey everyone, welcome to Locked On Lakers for Monday. Brian Kamenetsky, Andy Kamenetsky. The Lakers look like they've got their roster more or less set. How do they do through the big free agency weekend? That's next. You are Locked On Lakers. Your daily Los Angeles Lakers podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. Thanks to everybody for making Locked On Lakers your first listen of every day, Monday through Friday, no matter how or where you get your podcasts. It's always free, never buying a paywall. Locked On Lakers on YouTube is where you can go hang out with, what, 19,000 people now? We're getting there. We getting are there. getting there. A lot, of, uh, a lot of people following along this weekend, subscribing to the channel. So if you are new, we uh, welcome you and we say thank you. Uh, if you are a holdover, if you're an everydayer, we also say thank you. Um, just thank you. Thank you to everybody. Um, huge weekend for the Lakers, obviously with free agency, um, and the, the roster not completely done, but other than, um, what we all think will be one more center added to the roster, um, has taken shape and it took shape with quickly. a veterans minimum, just so people yes, know correct. that is, yes. that's the only mechanism they have at Unless this point. Unless Malik Beagley somebody. is looking for a position change because they can bring him back for more money. Um, than they, but but he's shorter than that, so I don't think it's going to happen. Um, so yeah, so we'll talk about the uh, the the backup center Jackson Hayes, who was uh, signed over the weekend by the Lakers to a one year plus a, a two year deal, second year player option with Jake Madison, who covered him for Locked On Pelicans for uh, his stint in New Orleans. So we'll we'll break down like what's good, what's bad about that signing because it's obviously one we spent a little bit of time on. Over the weekend, um, so we'll get to that. But first, Andy, let's talk about the the um, the team broadly here and what they did. I, I read this list on uh, the the special bonus show for Sunday, and I'll read it again. This is basically what the Lakers have going into the season um, as their their core rotation group: LeBron James, Anthony Davis, Rui Hachimura, Austin Reeves, uh, D'Angelo Russell. That's my guess for what the starting lineup will look like. Um, it could be Jared Vanderbilt with Rui coming off the bench, but something. It wouldn't surprise me if Rui came off the bench just for scoring punch, but for you scoring never know. punch, like a 50 50, whatever it is, but it wouldn't shock me. But there you go. Getting um, a lot of minutes either. I way. think he'll get more minutes than Jared Vanderbilt, if not, uh, oh, yeah. how, however, they, they, they portion that out. Uh, off the bench, your primary guys are uh, Gabe Vincent, Jared Vanderbilt, Torian Prince. Um, I think. Max Christie is going to be given every opportunity to be one of those guys. Then Jackson Hayes. Um, and then you know, guys like Jalen Hood, Shafino, kind of a wild card. I think you got to see what it looks like in summer league and in a training camp, but I wouldn't be shocked to see him get some minutes. I think they will try to figure out a way to see if what they have in Cam Reddish, but I wouldn't consider him to be as core. Um, and then you got your two-way guys and Maxwell um, Lewis as well. So, we talked about this on Sunday. Like that is a very credible top eight, top ten on a team that needs a credible top eight, top ten, top eleven to safely navigate the regular season and maximize their opportunities to have a healthy AD, healthy LeBron in the postseason. Yeah, I mean, we, we're going to break down some of the the different options and approaches the Lakers could have gone in to try to figure out just how good of an offseason that they had. But I think good is your baseline. I think it is really difficult to make an argument that the Lakers did not have, I think, a very good offseason. But I think good is as low as you could possibly go. The, the three biggest primary goals were mm -hmm. retain Austin Reeves, retain Rui Hachimura, retain D'Angelo Russell, maybe at a slightly different tier, because it's as much about you're not going to be able to replace the talent as it is D'Lo himself. But either way, it was important to bring him back. Yep. They not only got all three back, they got all three back at, I think, reasonable contracts with D'Angelo Russell, who I think was the diciest of the three in terms of the internal temperature on him. They have the smallest commitment. Austin Reeves, they ended up with the smallest financial commitment possible to him and i only say that because it could have been huge and they would have matched it the reeves contract is going to become really important in a couple of years when that first balloon payment 
was supposed to hit. Look, the Lakers gave him a, an out after three years. If things go on the current trajectory, he will almost certainly tear up that deal for the fourth year. But that third year to go into it with um, with just that whatever it is, almost fourteen million or something for the for the for the third year, uh, fourteen and a half, whatever that number turns out to be, like that's a that is a steal, right? And then you look at Torian Prince's in a lot of ways a replacement for Malik Beasley or a replacement for Troy Brown or both, depending on sort of how you imagine him being used, the things he brings on both sides of the ball. Frankly, I think he's an upgrade over both of them. Definitely an upgrade over Beasley. Gabe Vincent, I think, is a really good backup point guard that if you have to start, you're not going to be upset about it. Mm -hmm. And he is at oh, – Angelo Russell misses games. I mean, Gabe Vincent's right. going to start 15, 20 games this year for the Lakers. I'd be right. shocked he, if it was less. You know, we, we've talked before, and it's, you know, created some debate back and forth, whether on Twitter at Cam Brothers or in the comments section of – the YouTube page, and, and again, we always appreciate the comments about who is the better player between Gabe Vincent or Dennis Schroeder. Um, at the end of the day, I think they're fairly comparable, but even if you think Schroeder is a little bit better than Vincent, the drop-off is not so big that it becomes problematic for the Lakers. I think they are better now than they were heading into the playoffs with this revamped roster. I think they're better now. I think you know, there are a couple of things that are really interesting. First of all, Schroeder signed for 13 million a year. So even if the Lakers, the right, even if the Lakers wanted Schroeder over Vincent, if he knew that offer was out there, Lakers weren't going to go to, couldn't, like, not weren't going to go, couldn't go to 13 million. So that just wasn't a choice. Where, I, where the way I look at this is too, like, it was going to be really hard for the Lakers to, like really substantively improve like on a high end talent level without gutting the roster. You know, Kyrie Irving's better than, you know, Fred Van Vliet is better than like, but like to, to try to make a run at one of those types of guys, they would have had to gut the roster completely to do it. And then you're, I don't think you're better. And so the Lakers, the challenge for the Lakers, like you say, was bring back the guys who were important try to make yourselves a little bit better on the margins, try to build a roster that makes a little bit more sense, that has a little bit more balance. And the reason I think they are better now than they were before, I agree with you. I think Vincent for Schroeder is basically a wash. I think that I think they are close enough to each other that, you know, the biggest reason they're better is because Torian Prince fits is both a better player, more versatile offensively and defensively than a guy like Beasley, but he also fits the rotation better. He fits the balance of players better. And the 20 minutes that they can give him per game slots everybody else into better positions. I think that signing, more than all the other ones, is the one that tilts this for the Lakers because the other guys they brought in, like you say, I don't necessarily know our huge game changers. And then Jackson Hayes, which we'll talk about. I have some nervousness, not about Hayes, but about what they do with that, that 14th slot. But um, you have some names, Andy, that you want to, uh, to mention about what else they might have been able to do. Because that's really important when you evaluate these things. Did they choose the wrong players? Could they have gotten someone else? We talked about Bruce Brown last year. Is there a Bruce Brown for this year? We'll talk about it next. Locked on Lakers brought to you by Prize Picks and Laker fans. If you have not signed up for Prize Picks, you are missing out on daily fantasy made easy. Prize Picks has the best DFS prop game on the market. They offer more props than any other DFS prop operator. The superstar players, the bench players, just pick two to six players and predict whether they will notch more or less than their Prize Picks stats projections. And you can win up to 25 times your money. And Prize Picks offers projections on everything from MLB to WNBA to golf to cricket, even big three. Here are some of the former Lakers playing in Ice Cube's league that you can make some statsy predictions on. Michael Beasley, Jody Meeks, Earl Clark, Corey Brewer, and Devin Ebanks. Real ones, remember. Use the award-winning app on both the App Store and Google Play. Entries can be made in 60 seconds or less. Save fast withdrawals. Download the PrizePix app or go to prizepix.com. Sign up, play daily fantasy sports, and first-time users can receive a 100% 
instant deposit match up to 100 bucks using the promo code locked on. Again, don't forget the promo code locked on at the sign up for the instant match. If you are not playing prize picks, you don't know what you're missing. Yep. So Jake Madison from Locked On Pelicans coming up in about 10 minutes. Um, this question of what else might they have done? Um, where else could they have allocated resources? Um, they're thin at center. You know, I think that is that is unde undeniable. Was there a center that they could have gotten instead of, say, Gabe Vincent, and then maybe look for a backup point guard somewhere else? These are all really important questions. Last year, you and I both hoped that they uh, would have gone for somebody like Bruce Brown. Um, they didn't. Um, and But Bruce Brown this year wasn't an option. So you have some names, Andy, and how when you compare what the Lakers did through the first two days with what was out there and who went where for what, what, do you, what conclusions do you get to? Well, there's two things. First of all, you can talk about the route of, you know, getting, ri getting rid of Mo Bamba and Malik Beasley and putting yourself – in a position where you're not going to go into the tax, but you keep your full mid-level exception as opposed right. to going into the tax, having a smaller mid-level, but keeping Beasley and Bamba, whether as players, contracts, or both. Mm -hmm. I personally think this was the better strategy because I think what you lose in potential optionality, you make up for with a better actual roster. And I think mm -hmm. at the end of the day, the roster is what's most important if and you are in way, win now mode. It is not out of the uh, out of the question that Mo Bamba could end up back on the team. Sure, it, is, it sure. is not as of Sunday afternoon when we're or Sunday early Sunday evening when we're, we're recording this. He's still out there, and there is still chatter that the Lakers would be interested in bringing him back. And Bamba, despite just being released by the team, is not necessarily against it. Okay, so here, here are some of the guys that I don't know if it's the entire complete list of everyone that was signed or whatever, but I'll, I'll throw out some names. You can tell me if you would have preferred it or not in terms of uh, as opposed to who the Lakers brought in. Um, I don't even know if this was an option because I think he really wanted to be a part of the Jalen Brunson, Josh Hart, Villanova reunion. But Dante DiVincenzo, four years at what appeared to be the full mid-level with the Knicks. I don't know if the Lakers could have actually gotten that, but would you have rather had him than Gabe Vincent? Yes. I mean, I, I think DiVincenzo is a really good player, um, and I think a little more versatile, but he's also not a pure backup point guard. So, like, if you need a – if you're thinking about that, then, you know, positionality and skill set matters a little bit there. And you have to go f one more full year. Um, right. Again, I don't think it would have been an option because I who think – I, 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 I think you're probably right, but who do I think is a little better player? DiVincenzo, but like I, this all like you say, this is. I don't assume, unlike some people, I don't assume the Lakers get to go through the line, the buffet line first, and choose yeah. everybody they want, and then everybody else goes second. It's like right. yeah, everybody, you know, in, in the, <laughs> the old Kobe buffet line, I right? Eat first, how eat second, and it's not like figures it out. Like you know, as as much of a as a mess as they can be historically, you know, they're a playoff team now, and they are the Knicks. I mean, right. So, I mean, who do I think is a better player? DiVincenzo. Um, do I, but that, does that mean I don't think 11 million, 33 million for three years for Vincent is good? No, it doesn't mean that at all. Uh, part of the full mid level, four years, 32 million to the Rockets, Jock Landale. I'd rather have Gabe Vincent. I'd rather have Vincent. Uh, Mo Wagner, two years, 16 mil with Orlando. I'd rather have Gabe Vincent. I think so. Uh, Joe Ingles, two years, 22 mil for Orlando. I would definitely rather have Gabe Vincent. Although I, I got to say, Joe Ingles with this group would be a lot of fun to watch. He could be, except I am worried about him just breaking. and. Oh, falling. yeah, no, no question. No question. I, would, I'm just, I, I, would, I don't sweat Joe Ingles. Because, like, look, I mean, like, you give 8 million, it leaves 3 million, you find a backup point. You know, Corey Joseph just signed on Sunday for a minimum. It's like, he would he be... You know, and, and Joe Ingles has point guard qualities. Um, sure. So like, you know, are there combinations of this that, like, you go, yeah, okay. No, that's that's, that's part of it. Yeah, I mean, I, I again, if I could design it myself and know if I signed player A, I'd, I'd be able to get the best backup point guard that was available for $3.5 million that's left over. Okay, but I don't have that knowledge. Right. Uh Jordan Yang, Jordan Yang, three years, twenty-six million with Cleveland. 
So about eight ish, eight and a half per season. Stretch four, like that. legit, legit stretch, stretch four. I mean, sure. Yeah, he he. Okay, I would put him on a possibly would rather have him over Vincent. Again, you have to think about the trickle down effect because right. I mean, Schroeder's not only, an option. You only get one right guy, and so like you, you replacing Dennis Schroeder is a perfectly useful way to allocate that money. I don't like you because you have to replace him. And you right. know, I, I don't want to put Jalen Hutchifino in a place where he's forced to play big minutes early on a team with aspirations. I want him to earn that time. Could the Lakers use a legit stretch four? I mean, Yang is a really good three point shooter. Well, hopefully, hopefully that is t- uh, Torian Prince. Yang um, is an interesting player, but like, you know, they, they did check that box. And I think right. we talked about last time. I think Prince is a great signing. Yeah, uh, Javon Carter, three years, twenty million with the Bulls. I, to be fair, I don't know if the Lakers could have competed with the potential role Carter will have in Chicago. I think it is bigger than the one he would have with the Lakers. But in theory, you know, seven to eight million a year for Carter as opposed to eleven for Vincent. I mean, I'm okay. kind of indifferent. Yeah, I, I, I right. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna fillet anyone over that. <laughs> two uh, two years, sixteen million for Trey Lyles. I would. I'm fine with what the Lakers did. I I think Trey Lyles would be a very handy player for this team. Um, but I years. don't think Trey Lyles was going anywhere. I think I think the the Kings, if, if the Lakers would have met at eight million for Lyles, I think the Kings would have made it nine. Or they, they were not. I don't think they were letting him go. Right. You start getting into guys like Dwight Powell, Seth Curry, um, then you get, get into minimum guys, Drew Eubanks, who. To be honest, would I would rather have him um, than Jackson Hayes just because I think he's just a steadier, more predictable guy. But Phoenix, in this particular case, had the luxury of being able to go right after the veterans' minimum guys because that's all they had I mean, to look, work I, with. I feel like Lakers were targeting bigger guys from the beginning. They could have. But I mean, like you, you, I, I feel like you can walk and chew gum about it. If the Lakers can find a credible body, if Mo Bamba comes back with flaws, I mean Drew Eubanks has flaws. I mean he's not like, yes. I mean he's not like you know Joel Embiid. I mean, but he's, no, just he's like a backup quality center, right? When he is, so you know, and I just I, I on a team with Anthony Davis, and we'll talk about this next. On a team with Anthony Davis, it's really important to have a playable backup center, and Jackson Hayes hasn't been consistent enough over the course of his career. Flashes of potential, no question, and, and all of that. But he hasn't been consistent enough over the course of his career for me to feel comfortable with him as the only guy on a roster where Anthony Davis is going to miss 20 games. So and it, you know, it's not Jackson Hayes. It's Jackson Hayes in this context. So sure. who do they use to fill that slot? Changes the entire evaluation. But, yeah, I mean, right I mean, now, I get- I'd rather have Trey Lyles than Jackson Hayes. He's a better player. I go back to what I said at the top of the show. To me, the baseline for what they did this offseason is good. Whether you go very good, outstanding, excellent, whatever, that I think it's very difficult to say any lower than good, man. I, I think they did good. I think that they 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 have a hole that is opened up at, with the center. Um, and they need to close it. But I think they can. And so assuming they can do that, basically the move that tweaks it for me and it makes so i think if they just run it back with what they had that's you know more or less like that would have been a good off season because like again the structural it was really hard for the lakers to kind of keep their depth and raise their talent level a lot unless you get unless brooke lopez says fine i'll take your mid-level i just want to play in la like but short of magical thinking then that wasn't really an option so what you can do is you can improve yourself in the margins, you can rebalance the roster and rebalance the rotation a little bit and give yourself a second option other than Jared Vanderbilt as that sort of, uh, you know, four who can guard multiple positions or whatever, but can't shoot three pointers. Well, now you have options there where you can keep the size on the floor, but you have uh, Torian Prince and, you know, mm-hmm. somebody who can, sh- who can shoot the three. And I think swapping Beasley for Prince is what does it for me. So if they fill that hole, I am I think they had a great off season because I don't think it would have been I think it would be hard for them to do any better. I love their draft. So um yeah, I'm, I'm in. Um and we'll learn more about Jackson Hayes here in a second with Jake Madison. 
from Locked On Pelicans. I do want to remind people that today's episode is brought to you by Prize Picks. First time users can re, uh, receive a 100% instant deposit match up to $100 with the promo code Locked On. That's prizepicks.com, promo code Locked On. Uh, all right, Jake Madison next. All right, joining us right now to uh, break down Jackson Hayes and the signing of the Lakers. This is an important signing. He is right now the only other center guy near seven feet tall other than Anthony Davis on this roster. He's the host of Locked on Pelicans. He got an up-close view of Jackson Hayes for years. Uh, Jake Madison, he joins us. He also hosts the Locked on NBA podcast on Wednesday nights. Um, Jake, thanks for, for coming on. Why was uh, Jackson Hayes available at a veteran's minimum? Because he's not a good basketball player. Because is that I, I, I don't really know what other answer to say than that. You know, th this was just a guy that I think had worn out his welcome in New Orleans. And, you know, from texting with Andy when we were talking about this the other day, you know, there was a very clear cycle that you had seen with Jackson Hayes. They always were trying to get this guy an opportunity. He was the eighth overall pick. It was part of, you know, the Anthony Davis trade in theory that, you know, sent him from New Orleans to L.A. And this was a guy that, you know, I think on paper fits as the perfect. Perfect five next to Zion Williamson, a vertical spacing threat, a lob threat. That's a guy that, you know, you have to commit a defender to in the dunker spot. Might not shoot threes, but at least he can do that. So it keeps defenses honest a little bit. And they tried multiple times and there was a very clear kind of pattern with him. He would get minutes early on in the season, not play well in those minutes, go to the bench, get a ton of DNPs. Injuries would happen. He would step back into the rotation or the starting lineup, play somewhat well. The season would end you hope he takes the leap next year comes into next season getting minutes doesn't play well goes to the bench so like and this repeated for basically four years entirely right like this is a guy who has 50 some starts in the nba they really tried to make him fit and he just never was able to put it all together and then i think there's some just other stuff that rubbed people within the organization the wrong way they were wondering if he wanted to focus more on instagram and kind of saying like i'm an nba player and living that lifestyle versus actually acting like you're an NBA player and doing kind of all the professionalism and things like that that you need with it. And I think that's why basically, you know, at the end of the season, they were like, goodbye, like, you know, pulled the qualifying offer, had no intention of re-signing him whatsoever, unless maybe just the market got like that thin and there was no one else to bring back. I could have seen it. But for the most part, I think at the trade deadline this past year, the writing was on the wall that his time in New Orleans was done. With those inconsistencies, do you think it's all purely or even mostly purely about a lack of dedication to the game or were there limitations that started to show with Hayes as a player? I want to get into his strengths as well or what what were the biggest strengths he showed, but as far as those inconsistencies, what do you think could have caused it beyond just a lack of dedication? So th there's a number of things. You know, if if you were if we're doing some blame pie here and you know, I'd probably put like 70% of it on Jackson Hayes, but there's 30% I think that goes to the organization. You know, three three head coaches in 4 years certainly isn't going to help you even though all of those coaches have tried to give you opportunities. You know, they also wanted him to try and shoot three pointers and to space the court and oftentimes especially the past 2 years, you saw him standing in the short corner. Like this was something that bothered the heck out of me in New Orleans. Why are we putting a seven footer that's not a good three point shooter is that anchor man in the corner to try and space the court? And it's just like a, a, a position and a role that just doesn't seem suited to his talents. When this is a guy that's a vertical lob threat, that's a freak athlete. And maybe you should play to those strengths. So I don't think it's all entirely on Jackson Hayes. There were moments where he wasn't put in position to succeed. But when you watch him on defense and kind of the lack of awareness, right? The lack of rebounding and fight for certain things like that's on him but certainly it's not entirely on Jackson Hayes and look this is a dude who's seven feet you know that was a former uh, wide receivers dad played in the NFL this is a guy that has some just incredible genetics and athleticism there's you know a lot that makes you look at him and be like he could be good and so I'm not ruling him out him having like a decent NBA career when the light bulb goes on or he finds a situation that's kind of more conducive to him you know, I mean that, and that's sort of the the I, I assume the working operating theory that the Lakers have here is you know better structure, 
then certainly what the Lakers have now is a, is a, is a better structure and a better culture, I think, than what they've had in New Orleans for the last few years. Um, and it's similar, by the way, to what they're hoping is the case with Rui Hachimura. Correct. They yeah. saw those three months. What happened with Malik Monk now twice since he got the hell out of Charlotte. Like, right. He's been you know, two for two. Put a better put a player in a better situation. He grows up a little bit and all that. Um, how 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 reasonable a a gamble is that? I mean, and there and it's it's sort of a separate thing because like how how important he is to the Lakers based on their roster construction is a separate question from how likely it is that Jackson Hayes can find that light bulb, but also probably helps it in LA. He's not going to be the eighth pick in the draft. That was a key part of the Anthony Davis deal. He's going to be a dude they signed for the minimum. So the, the expectations I think are different, which often makes a difference with players. But I mean, like if you had to kind of forecast, like a, put a number on how likely it is that he actually does turn into a solid, useful backup player on a really team of big aspirations, where would you put it? That's a tough one. I don't know. 50%. Like, I, I don't really know how to quantify that That's necessarily. Good. Like, I, you know, I, I think taking a flyer on him on a minimum deal, it's, is the second year player option? Is that what I yes. read correctly? Right. Like, I think that's fine. Like, I have no problem with that type of contract for Jackson Hayes, right? 7.7 on the qualifying offer, which the Pelicans, if they put that out there, were like terrified he would take, certainly isn't worth that. But I think for, you know what, let's just take a chance on this dude and see what he can do. And maybe there's some less pressure there. You know, I I wonder like, what's what's an impact of a guy like LeBron James gonna have on him? You know, one of the things you saw, and this rubs fans the wrong way, maybe more so than say like me or media, curious what you both think on this as well is you know the team would be losing by 30 and he's just kind of like yucking it up on this on on the bench having fun enjoying himself instead of kind of being like upset that they're losing and he wasn't playing well and all of those things and fans kind of hate some of that I don't know if that's a problem necessarily because I don't want people to be miserable all the time and so if you could find some fun in what you're doing I think that's important but you know if LeBron James holds him to a high standard and I would assume LeBron does that of his teammates I wonder if that gets some more out of him right if he realizes like oh I can't show up to practice and kind of joke around I need to take this more seriously because I don't want to deal with LeBron James where you could argue that New Orleans had a lack of maybe player leadership to kind of hold Jackson Hayes accountable to that so I think kind of just like greener pastures certainly is a good thing for him here I think he definitely needed a fresh start like I don't think he wanted to come back to New Orleans at all I think he's going to enjoy playing in LA I think he'll like that whether that's a good or a bad thing you know but I don't mind a veteran minimum contract for him like this is a dude that will have a number of highlight dunks for y'all this coming season. Like he can get up there and throw it down. And if you have a lob threat that can loft it up, he can basically flush anything that you put out. We saw that in his first summer league game. You know, because of that athleticism, you see some blocks from him that you don't see, you know, from other type of players. And he's a seven footer that can defend on the perimeter because of that athleticism. That's a really useful thing in today's NBA. So there's a lot of things that he does well. You know, Andy, you wanted to hear some of the strengths. So here you go. You know, those are some things that he does well. Those are things you can't teach either. You can teach everything else. And if you use him more in the pick and roll, more as a dunker spot kind of guy than in the short corner, yeah, I think you're going to get more production out of him just because you're putting him in a better position to succeed than, you know, whatever the heck the New Orleans offense was. Yeah, and I mean, you mentioned the effect of having LeBron. I think there's also the idea of spending time learning from Anthony Davis, like not just professionalism, but like how to be one of the best big men in the league, you know, a top 75 guy who's been all NBA, like that's useful. Phil Handy's track record with development, you know, the organization's track record with development. I I think those are all things that I'm sure give the Lakers some degree of optimism with this beyond athleticism or things that come with just pure athleticism. Were there things that you saw Hayes do well even like in flashes or instinctively things like that? Or is he really a player that just gets by on pure athleticism? Defensive awareness, you know, that kind of thing, like understanding of positioning and and those sorts of (laughs) things. No, no. 
I, I wish, you know, it might be a different story here in New Orleans if that was the case. It, it's mainly his athleticism. Like the dude is still, I think, very, very raw and just kind of hasn't been molded. And I think you make a great point of, you know, look, Anthony Davis is one more athletic bigs in the league. Maybe he can teach Jackson Hayes how to use that effectively. Right. And I think that's something that really could be helpful for him in his development as a player. You know, look, there's some potential untapped shooting potential there, too, I think. Like, I do think he has range from three. We saw him start to take more threes. It didn't look terrible. If he can get that off consistently, that's an unguardable shot, essentially. You know, give, given the rate and how Anthony Davis shoots threes now, maybe that's not what you want him to be doing. But there's some of that there. You know, he's not a good rebounder either. He is. So I'll tell you this. He is a good offensive rebounder. And he does understand kind of how to get some of those putbacks and things like that. You know, maybe that's athleticism. Maybe that's not. He's good at that. He's not a good defensive rebounder. And that's kind of been part of the problem with him. If you're running him at center, you need others that are going to be able to help team rebound because otherwise you are going to be giving up a lot of offense boards with that. But on the flip side of that, he's actually a very good kind of dude at like just cleaning up misses and flushing them down because he does seem to have some of the timing down on that. How is he actually in transition too? Because that's something the Lakers really look to do offensively also if if he happens to be even passable in transition defense he's automatically on the high end of what we saw last year not great there offensively <laughs> like, no, look there's a reason they were just like goodbye man like he was the eighth overall pick and they were like like sure. see you like don't let the door hit you on the way out that says even as if the pelicans aren't the most well-run organization right like that says something Thing, I think, you know, if he signed in on a veteran on a minimum deal, there wasn't a huge market out there sure. for him, for someone who should maybe have some interest just due to the potential, you know, in terms of getting out and running in transition, he can cover the whole basketball court in three steps. This dude, like, go look at some of the highlights, go look at that first summer league that he had. And he was absurd. Like, again, the strides that he takes, you know, everyone uses like gazelle when you're talking about someone like that. But, you know, that's kind of what he looks like when he gets out and runs. You're using him to finish the play in transition. But if you have someone say like when he played with Lonzo Ball, right, great in those lead ahead passes in transition this dude can eat those up and finish and no one's going to be able to stop that yeah i mean uh, to your point somebody was like you know go check out his youtube clips oh, um, I'm, 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 like right I, after well i'm just saying like that was what somebody <laughs> on the comment section <laughs> I, I mean look man, you, I, wait, I, I like to post my highlights too uh, well, but you, you like, gotta remember too that. He, he's of that generation yeah, that posts total everything sense. online i mean like the, that's what they all do. <laughs> there's, there's an Instagram story, an Instagram selfie, like within two minutes of every single game ending, like big win, big loss. You know, one of, one of the negatives that he would do is, you know, at times he wasn't getting a lot of minutes. So like when he got minutes, instead of being like, I'm going to make the most of this, you'd be like, why, why is he taking a half court three with 18 seconds left in the clock and like five minutes left in the game? That's not really winnable, but like, what, what are you right, doing? Right. That, that's not, like, that, that won't, if he tries that in LA he'll he will yeah, never see get, the light of day yeah um, and then and, immediately after that it's like an Instagram selfie of like had fun and everyone's like what are you doing dude <laughs> yeah I mean it's it'll be interesting to see like where those you know Lonnie Walker for example was in the same boat San Antonio let him go but mm -hmm. commanded a mid-level at the very least um and 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 played pretty well for the Lakers last year all things considered I just yeah, he's it, another it, guy that I think the Lakers are hoping their track record of teams giving up on a lottery pick or a first round pick early they can hone something that these other right. teams did i would also argue that lonnie walker was a much more productive player to that point than jackson hayes has been um sure. but like if you the situation the lakers are in now this is my last question but the situation the lakers are in now is one where on a team with anthony davis who is bankable to miss 20 games i think you know if it's less than that great um, you just hope it's not too much more. Jackson Hayes either needs to be playable or the Lakers are going to be forced to go small kind of all the time um, or a big their, their biggest version of small. Um, they will not be able to put a center on the floor at the very least. How confident are you, would you be as a Lakers, member of the Lakers coaching staff, um, that, you know, you know what, we can get 25 games out of Jackson Hayes when Anthony Davis isn't available. How many minutes are you playing him in those games? 
23 and a half. I think, you know, I think you can do that. No, no, <laughs> I, no, I, made think, up, I, I made up that, that number. I, I don't, I don't think you want him playing 36 minutes, you know, necessarily, unless he really starts to show something. But if you need him as a spot starter, you know, two years ago when the Pelicans made that run through the play and tournament played Phoenix in the first round, he started like the second half of that mm -hmm. season. They started him and Jonas Valanciunas together. He was kind of like a starter in name only. He's playing 10 minutes in the first half, 10 minutes in the second half, right? You know, maybe like seven minutes to start the game, three minutes to close each half, something along those lines. They won games. Like it worked. You had him. Okay. With uh, that makes me feel better. Big, that right? makes me like, feel significantly better. Yeah, like it's it's doable in the right circumstances. And if he's got his kind of like mentals lined up to be like, I'm going to try and take advantage of this, then we saw that, right? Like he ended the season as a starter in the playoffs. And then next season, they're like, you're going to get big minutes. And he came out and just like fell flat on his face, essentially. You know, it followed that same pattern that I was talking about early. But you know, it's a pattern where at the end of every year, you're like, oh, there's something there. And instead of like, we need to trade this guy right now, it was hold on, let's see what we can do. Again, that says something too, I think. So there's potential there. Like, I think if you're starting him 20 minutes a game as an Anthony Davis replacement and trying to go kind of committee behind him, like, yeah, you could get away with that. All right. Um, that makes me feel better. Um, he is the host of Locked On uh, Pelicans and the Wednesday edition of Locked On NBA. Uh, Jake Madison with some really good insight into a very important player right now on the revamped Lakers roster. Thanks so much for coming on. We appreciate it. Of course. Thanks for having me on, you guys. Uh, Locked On Lakers on YouTube is where you can go to see the show, hang out with, uh, what is it now, 18,000 people? Andy? Almost 19, man. Almost We're within, 19, I think, like 100 of 19. So free agency thank you, everybody. For that. Thank you very much, everybody. Um, much more to come this week. Uh, probably take uh, first, uh, you know, July 4th off, but uh, we'll be back after that. So we'll see everybody on Wednesday.